Hello, I'm Jerry Dearman, and I'm starting something brand new with this video. You know, it was a little over three years ago that in prayer, I sensed very strongly that God wanted me to launch a brand new 501c3 nonprofit organization called Solid Lives. And we put our discipleship in there, Operation Solid Lives, and Men's 3XY, and many other ministries. And shortly after that, the Lord spoke very clearly to me to start pushing the ministry of the church down into homes. Well, I knew what that meant for our home church, The Rock, but I didn't know what that meant for this brand new young ministry called Saul Alive because we weren't a church. But sure enough, as we prayed, the Lord led us to launch house churches, and today we have 40 active Solid Lives house churches. It's a miracle because we really didn't have experience with house churches but God has helped us by the Holy Spirit. The purpose of these new videos that we're doing, and this is the first, is God is calling us to prayer. So I'm doing a short welcome, a little bit of vision, a little bit of clarity about what God has done and is doing. And then we're gonna have a teaching from Carol Ward. For those of you that have already heard Carol Ward, she's come recently to us and wow, Talk about an anointed servant of the Lord and someone experienced with prayer in prayer movements. Well, you already know what that's like, but for those of you that have not yet heard Carol's teaching on prayer, you are in for a treat today. And so what we're going to do is, after I finish this short video of a welcome and a bit of vision, we're going to have a segment of Carol's teaching on prayer. And then when it finishes, I want you right there in your house church, I want you to gather together and call on the Lord and begin to pray. You can play a little bit more of the video if you'd like after Carol finishes her teaching because she calls the prayer meeting to prayer. And you can watch and catch the spirit of it if you want. But as soon as you catch it and you're comfortable, you can pause the video but continue to pray right there. God wants to answer our prayers, but he doesn't want to answer only our desires. He wants us to pray the will of God so that he can bring the will of God to pass. You know, house churches are important because Jesus said, go make disciples of all the nations. The church in America has been in decline for the past couple of decades. And so now God is saying, I'm doing something different. Instead of trying to get everybody to come into a church building, I'm sending the church into the harvest. And this is what house churches are. House churches are here to stay. And I believe it's a growing trend that is conceived by the Holy Spirit. Now, just before I pray for you, I want to thank all of you who have been contributing, who have been tithing and giving to Solid Lives. You may not realize how impactful it's been, but let me tell you from the seat that I sit in, it is very impactful. None of it has gone to me. But we have been able to hire a very competent team and to invest into ministry that would help us to support, to facilitate what God is doing out there in the harvest. And a big part of the reason we could grow like we have and sustain the house churches that we have sustained is because of you being obedient to the Lord and tithing and giving. And so as we pray, I want to pray over you that God opens the windows of heaven over you, just as he promised in Malachi 3, and that he pours out blessing on you and, and myself too, because I also am a tither and a giver and a contributor to Solid Lives. So thank you for your giving. By the way, we never receive physical cash or checks in our house churches because we want to protect our leaders and we want to protect our house churches. So we give through either the Solid Lives app, you can click give and then choose either certified house church if your house church is certified or other house churches and you can give through that method. Or you can give on our website solidlives.com and click give and there'll be the same options. So let me pray for you and then we're going to jump into Carol Ward's teaching and then I call you to prayer and God is going to answer our prayer. So Father, I bless this house church in the name of Jesus, every member of this house church. Lord, especially those who are tithing, who are giving, contributing to the vision that you have launched through Solid Lives, 
Lord, open the windows of heaven above them and pour out blessing upon them in the name of Jesus. And Lord, as Carol teaches us, may we grasp it, may it strengthen our faith, and then Lord, ignite us in prayer, even in this house church meeting. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, here we go. Here's Carol's teaching. Lord, we pray that as we come very, very close, we draw near to you, you will draw near to us. You're faithful to do that. We can take one step towards you, and you run a mile towards us because you're waiting for that hunger in us. You're waiting for that advancement. You're waiting to pull us with cords that can't be broken close to your heart so that we can live there and feel and see and have our perspective from inside your heart. And Lord, I thank you that you are the all-consuming fire. And the more we come to that burning bush, the more we come to be melted at your presence. As you said, the mountains melt like wax in your presence. Then, Lord, the more that fire becomes a part of us, the fire upon the altar of our hearts begins to consume us. Unquenchable flames in our mouth it burns, as Jeremiah 5 says, and in our bones, as he said in Jeremiah 20. We just ask you, that you would impart a burning within us that cannot be quenched. It cannot be silenced. That the things around us cannot put it out or distract it or quench it or disturb it. We want to hear you say what you said to Mary when Martha was very busy with things. And you said, Mary chose the best. And it will not be taken away from her. So, Lord, we want to choose the best tonight. And we can have your assurance that when we choose that, to consume your words and sit at your feet, minister to you, it will not be taken away from us. We seal it. Draw each of us in. Deeper, Lord. Deeper. Deeper. In your powerful name we pray. Amen. 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 Sometimes the word of God is the bread of heaven. John 6. Fresh right out of the oven. If you like fresh baked bread, right? (laughs) Smells good. Smells sweet. So after we're on a three-week fast and I pour the word out to the guys, I said, now you just had breakfast. Go home and enjoy and so that, you know, your, your stomach might be growling, but your heart's absolutely full. Sometimes it's the river of living water, John 3, John 7, out of your belly. Sometimes it's the fire in your bones, as Jeremiah said in 5 and 20, the fire in your mouth and the fire in your bones. Sometimes it's the rock in Matthew 7. Sometimes it's the honey from the honeycomb in Psalm 19. Sometimes it's what you're going to put on your mind to get a new thinking, a new perspective transformed by the renewing of the mind. Sometimes it's the sword of the spirit. Whatever we need him to be is the way we can find him. And you know him in the measure you need him. Speaking of the sword, one time I was doing battle, and the Lord said to me, uh, would you just stop a minute? And I you know, felt like I was waging the sword, speaking the word, declaring it, taking it. Th- he said, hang on, hang on. He said, check your sword. And he wanted to teach me something in this. He said, just look at your sword for a minute. And I'm stopping where well, I look at the word of God. But from kind of an outward perspective looking in and I looked at the sword in my hand so to speak and he said does it have blood on it and I said well not not sure what do you mean like have I killed a few giants no he said your blood I said what do you mean he said you're gonna wage a war with greater authority When your sword has blood on it, your blood. And then he started to talk to me. He said, I take the sword 
of the spirit and I circumcise your heart I cut away your flesh I cut away your wrong motives and desires I do surgery on you and I use the sword to do it because the Word of God is profitable for teaching reproof correction rebuke training and righteousness second Timothy 3 16 he said I'm gonna operate on you with the sword and when that sword has blood on it because I've done surgery and you've allowed me to do surgery in your own heart to cut away the flesh and the things that are distracting the cares of the world fleshly desires he said you will wage a war with greater authority because you understand what it means to be cut away from the things of the earth, to be detached, and you'll wage a war with greater authority. Let me say this about authority too. When we pray, we're gonna pray with authority, and we're gonna go into a spirit of desperation tonight, and I'm gonna explain that, and we're gonna ask God for fresh baptisms of desperation as he takes us to new levels. But when I was talking about authority, I said, God, how come sometimes we, we've been successful or we, I don't, not we've succeeded, but different team members. Remember the disciples came to Jesus in Matthew 17 and said, we couldn't get that devil out of him. We couldn't get the devil out of the boy. They weren't successful. But Jesus just said a word and cast it out. I said, you obviously had greater authority than the disciples. So there are growing, there's a growth in levels of authority right? You grow in authority. And he said, I'm going to give you a key. This kind comes not out except by prayer and fasting. You also grow in authority as you exercise authority. If we never exercise faith, never exercised our muscles, never exercise stepping out and walking in that authority, we wouldn't know how to use it. Now, we know it's given to us because we're seated with him in heavenly places. We know he paid for it because he bought back in the new covenant on the cross the authority we lost in the garden, right? Adam and Eve were told, go take dominion, go rule, go multiply, go reproduce. They lost it with sin. The cross took the curse. He was nailed to a tree. It's cursed. Jesus took that curse, broke the strongholds of darkness, got back the keys of the kingdom went to death hell and grave and won the victory to put us back in heavenly places beside him and delegate back to us the authority that we lost he paid for it in full but he started talking to me about authority he said there's four kinds of authority and these aren't necessarily levels but they're perspectives of authority when you come against different situations and he said one of them is delegated. He said, I've delegated my bride to rule and reign in this earth, to come against the strongholds of darkness, push it back, bring my kingdom down, and I've equipped her and empowered her to do that. Delegated authority through the power of the Holy Spirit. Finish the job the son started. That's what the church is left here to do. So we have been delegated a specific assignment and the authority to go with it. The next one is earned authority. Earned authority are those that exercise it. They, they're skilled with the weapons of warfare. They know how to pray. They come against strongholds of darkness. If they couldn't cast the demoniac off to that little boy and Jesus said prayer and fasting, they go home and go, I'm going to pray and fast and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be able to do that. Because Jesus said greater works than these, right? So you, you earn that as you, as you walk selflessly, sacrificially, seeking the word, seeking the truth to be like Jesus. In the army, aren't people promoted in ranks because they've done military exploits? So if you're, if you're a captain and you've won great battles, maybe next year you're going to be a major, right? You're moved up in position. In, in Uganda, I mean in South Sudan, I was sitting with this general once and I had coffee with him and I was sharing about Jesus. He had a book on the table about how to take a guerrilla army and make it into an organized army. And they were trying to learn how to do this as a nation from the nation of South Africa. And I said, well, that's wonderful. What are you learning in that book? He said, I don't know. I can't read. 
Now he's a general, high ranking general. I said, oh. And then I said, well, you are high, very high ranking, Your Honor. And he said, oh yes, I got my rank, not from his education, from how many people he killed, from how many battles he won. It had nothing to do with an education. And so God qualifies the unqualified. I've seen people that can't even speak English. I've seen people that can't read. I've seen, and they walk in such an anointing, heaven shakes when they walk into place. They move mountains and walk on water because God's ways are not ours. And they've walked in such a realm in the spirit that they've been taught by God. Not necessarily as the world teaches. They didn't teach, learn that out of a book. So there's earned authority. There's delegated authority. Then there is inherited authority. Now in Africa, we have chiefs in the village. And the chief's son is the next one that's going to be the chief. So if anything happens to the chief, or if he's sick, or if he's gone, you go find the son of the chief. And he's now, not because he earned it. He didn't earn what his dad did to be chief. But because he was, he inherited he inherited the position to be the chief. And so in a sense, it's delegated, but it's because of his bloodline. It's because of his lineage. So we also have an inherited authority by being sons and daughters of the living God. Amen? So there's delegated, there's earned, there's inherited. And then the last one is covenantal. Now, I don't know if you'll find these in a book, and I don't even know if you'll agree with me, but I'm just telling you how the Holy Spirit teaches me what I need to know. Okay, and covenantal authority, he showed me in the word of God where he said, David, I'm going to give you favor be or, or David's kids, Solomon, I'm going to give you favor because I made a covenant with your father. You see that when God makes a covenant with us, we've entered into the covenant he made with our forefathers and we can stand, but God, you covenant it. Moses reminded God of his covenant to Israel. Don't destroy them. Take me out if you need to. But you made a covenant. Now, if you've born a child, you have more covenantal authority over your children than I do. I can pray with spiritual authority, delegated authority, but I, I can't pray with covenanted authority. You get me? When I go into South Sudan and I'm praying for a tribe in a village, if I do warfare, passionate warfare, and those tribes people are spirit-filled and understand battle, and they do passionate, violent warfare for their land and their people. When I saw this, I said, God, I'm entering into their labor. But they have the covenantal authority. They are of the land. And when you are of the land, you have a covenant to right to be a gatekeeper. I don't own land in Florida. I don't pay taxes here. I don't, th this isn't my dwelling place, but it is yours. You're a gatekeeper. You have a covenantal authority. I can come into agreement with you, but I don't have the same authority over your state as you do. Do you, do you see what I'm saying? Because you live here. And God has given you the covenant responsibility of your city and your land. So remember those different perspectives of authority. Now I want to talk about a baptism of desperation. In the book of Acts, they went from infilling to infilling to infilling of the Holy Spirit. It doesn't, they had a baptism of the Holy Spirit experience, but then they got filled again and filled again and filled again, just like we need to. I mean, our tank's going to run empty of gas. It doesn't last for, we need an infilling. We need a constant infilling. There's a difference between being passionate and being desperate. Big difference, okay? You can be very passionate. You say, oh, I love that worship song. Or Oh, I love that person, and you're passionate. You want to spend time with them. Romance, intimacy, okay? Desperate, passion is a strong feeling, desire, attraction, affection. Desperation, on the other hand, is a driving force that will not be silenced. It drives you. Live or die. 
You're driven to lay hold of something. It consumes you with intensity and purpose and everything else becomes insignificant compared to what you're pursuing. We're going to see in the word where God answers desperation. If we had somebody that was sick and uh, in, in, in the village, okay, and we're, we're all going to take up an offering so that person we prayed for, but he needs to have surgery. We're going to take up an offering so the guy can have surgery. And everybody takes up an offering, and we pray, and we, you know, he goes to the hospital to have surgery. And I've seen this happen. And they send him to the hospital to have surgery, and the surgery didn't take and the doctor says, well, he may, he may not make it. And so everybody's praying and grieving and that kind of thing. And maybe the guy makes it, maybe he doesn't. On the other hand, I've seen a family where the child had to have surgery. They didn't take up an offering. They sold everything they had to save that boy's life. They cleaned out. And they said, take our last dollar. And if that doesn't work, we're going to go to the next doctor and the next doctor. That's desperation. The other one is concern. You have a burden for something. You're going to give towards it. Desperation, you're going to sell out. If it's your last dollar, you're going to sell out. Nothing else matters but the survival of that boy. And you're going to go after it with everything in you. And so we're going to look in the word of pictures of desperation. Now, I'm going to tell you a, a story because I like to tell stories, and this is a, the, just, just to motivate your face and the faith, and then we're going we're gonna to dive into some scriptures. If you write them down, this will help us go into prayer because we're going to go into concert prayer. We're going to learn different kinds of prayer. Nothing's new to you. You've done it before. And then we're going to learn, we're going to do some popcorn praying maybe in the, at, at that, towards the end of the evening. And that's where we come into agreement with each other. Pop, stand up, read the word. Another one, stand up, pray, stand up, read the word, pop. And we come into agreement. Huh? We just call it popcorn prayer. It's a little different than lengthy intercession. When we're having national prayer gatherings, 11 hours of prayer, we have lengthy intercession times. But when we have a whole group of people, and we have a couple of hours, the prayer that is inside of you will spark a fire in everybody around you. But if I never listen to that prayer, I don't know how to agree with it. You see what I'm saying? If I don't know what's in your heart, I don't know how to come into agreement. And things people pray will be deposited in your spirit prophetically that will activate something in the middle of the night and take you to another level. That's what it means to have every joint supplying. The ligaments in the body of Christ. Now, we were in three weeks, to, one or two, three weeks. I don't remember because we fast and pray about just about everything. So I, different lengths of fast for different things. And I was going into South Sudan by vehicle. Now, everybody flies there. I don't fly. I go on the roads. And I want to go on the roads through the rebels, the ambushes, the guns, and all that. Because I said, if we don't ride the roads, who's going to blow the devils off? I said, I'm going to blow the devils off the road so the other people can travel safely. But if we just fly over the devils and nobody wants to touch them, we'll never blow them up and never get them out of there. So that's, I always go the roads. And they look at me and go, why, you love this nation. I said, I love this nation. I lay my life down for it. But I said, God loves it more. And I said, he's given us authority over that. And so... Maybe that's some of my, you know, my, my pioneer heart because pioneer hearts blazing a trail where a trail hasn't been blazed. So we've been in prayer and fasting and, and I'm getting ready to go to South Sudan. And this is just a couple of years ago and, um, in the, in, in the vehicle and on this road, it's about an eight hour trip from, from Uganda up there on this road every day, there's ambushes every day, killing and, uh, and, and, the, the way the rebels do, by the way, when, when they kill the soldiers, government rebels, all kinds of rebels, demonic rebels, when they kill the soldiers, they put on the soldiers' uniforms. So when you see them, you have no idea, is that a rebel or is that a soldier? Because they're wearing the same uniform. And they get the soldiers' guns. And then they go do ungodly things and corrupt things and illegal things. So they do drive-by shootings to all these vehicles or... They attack a vehicle, they take the vehicle off the road, they rape, they loot the car, they murder, and then they burn the vehicle. 
in that order. So when you're going up that road and you see all the burned vehicles along, burned buses, burned this, that's what that is. And it's on the news so much that we don't watch the news. We just say we're going. So I'm in the vehicle that day, and I have, usually I'm, sometimes I'm driving the Land Cruiser, but I had a team, a couple, couple pastors in the front, taking them, because we had rice and beans, food, and Bibles to take to the other pastors up there. And uh, we get to the border, South Sudan. My friends, my military friends are at the border, officers, commanders, South Sudan, they all know me. And so we get to the border, and the friends stop me, the military commanders. He said, you're not going any farther. Up the road to Juba. I said, yes, I am. No, you're not. I said, yes, I am. No, you're not. And he just banged heads with me for a while. And then he realized I was going to do it anyway. So he said, okay, just a minute. So he goes and he, call, and he makes a phone call. He says, you just wait here. So I waited for probably 20 minutes. And he said, then we'll let you go. Well, here comes big military trucks with soldiers, fully armed SPLM about 45 of them. And there was a big truck in the front full of soldiers and a big truck in the back. He said, these are gonna be your escorts. I said, escorts? I don't use escorts. I said, I got Psalm 91. I said, you think these guys are gonna stop a bullet? And so he said, president's orders. I said, president? He said, yeah, I called, I called Salvacure, president, president's office. I said, what'd you do that for? He said, because you're his responsibility. And he, and he wants to make sure you get there safely. And he realizes you're stubborn enough to go anyway. So here's your escort. I said, okay, sir, whatever you say. So we get in line. And he said, other vehicles would like to go too. Since they're going to escort you, they'll get in line too. Now I know when there's any kind of a convoy going, because I've gone in other directions where it's government's orders to go in a convoy. And when a convoy is going, the con you don't stop. You can't stop to find a toilet. You can't have a flat tire. You don't stop because rebels pop out of the bush, guerrilla warfare, and like I said, they take you off. It's rape, it's loot, it's murder, burn the car, and that's ever, all the time. So you, you just don't, you just go when you go through. And it's about uh, four or five hours nonstop on these roads. So I'm in the convoy, and uh, one of our guys up there is driving, and another pastor sitting in the front, and uh, we, get, we start praying. The minute we start in the car, that's the first thing we do, pray, start sharing scriptures. So we were just quoting scriptures from memory, praying over the scriptures. We hadn't actually gotten our, our Bibles out yet, like we do, because that within the first 30 minutes or an hour, we get the word out and start reading and praying. And we were about 30 minutes to an hour up the road, when the convoy stopped. And there's probably about 10 vehicles in that, in that line with us. So there's a big military truck in the front and a military truck in the back, and the convoy stops. And I'm going, thinking, well, this isn't real good, but I don't know what's going on up there, and you can't bypass you know, the military, so you just, you just sit and wait. I'm sitting in the back seat, and sure enough, two big old burly seven-foot Tribes people, they've got the scars. I knew exactly what tribe they were from. Had on military uniforms, AK-47s. They opened either side of the back door where I was sitting in the back seat. Got in the car real fast, squished me in the middle of them, slammed the door, and yelled to the driver, well, you're escort now. You do exactly as we say. Angry faces. Didn't take a lot of discernment to see that they were not the South Sudan military. And so, but they were dressed in their uniforms. I knew exactly who they were and what they intended to do. You follow us now, get off course. So I told, the, I told David Drive and I said, you do exactly as they tell you to do. So he began getting off course. Now the one on my left, they put their AK-47s between their knees, both of them, just growling. I mean, these guys have been born in blood, 62 years of war, lived in blood, Blood is nothing to shed, no value of human life. They do anything to anybody anytime, and it's mob violence and, and just uh, pre-law, you know, kind of thing. So this other guy on my left, he gets a big string of bullets out of his pocket. He starts rolling his bullets around, puts a pistol on his lap. So he, I thought, he's got two guns. 
This guy has one gun. So I'm thinking all this real fast in a matter of split seconds. I didn't have time to do any praying and fasting, okay? <laughs> this is why I'm saying we got to be desperate for God at all times. Because if we're serious and mean business about God using us, we're going to find ourselves in situations that, like Paul, like, like a, a Paul said to Timothy, be instant. In, was it Paul or Peter? Instant in season and out of season. Instant. Be ready. Be prepared. And so he got his, he, he got his pus, pistol. Now, I'm sitting there for a second, I think, as many as were led to the spirit of the sons of God. I said, God, what do you want me to do? I said, if I'm going to see you in a little bit, I want to go happy. And so I said, and I said, if you have something to tell me, tell me fast, because I'm going to see you. And all of a sudden, I have no other thought except the word. If we ever think there's an ounce of anything in us that can come against any battle, then, then we're, we're deceived. All right? We can do nothing without him, but we can do everything with him. And greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. And he is the word. So I had a box of Bibles behind me, and we had not started opening and reading. We were just praying. I turned around as fast as I could. I grabbed one of those Bibles. I whipped around to that guy on my left. I waved it in his face, and I said, I am so glad you're in the car with us today. I said, do you know what this is? I said, and do you know what the, it has to say? And I said, by the way, what is your name? And I'm just talking like a, like a mad person. Because I found that David saved his life by acting like a crazy man. Now, I didn't think about that till later, but I wasn't trying to imitate David. But I just thought, I am going to get his attention, and I'm going to keep it. And so I'm waving this in his face, and I'm talking like this, 90 miles, and I'm right in his face. And he's like this, and he says, well, Jacob, a jock or something like that. He has a Western name and then a, and then a dinga name. And I said, Jacob? I said, Jacob, your name is in here. I said, do you know you're famous? Do you know who Jacob is? I said, and do you know who his dad was? By the way, do you know who his kids were? Let me tell you about Jacob. He was such a famous man. You're named after Jacob. Do you know that? He was spellbound. And he stood there and he put, his, he, put his, he put his gun down. And I went and I said, let me tell you about Jacob's dad. And then I said, let me tell you about his granddad. And by the way, let me tell you where Jacob came from. I started in Genesis. And I talked 90 miles an hour from Genesis to Revelations for four hours. Hey, man, four hours. I don't know if I took a breath, but this word better be in you because you don't have time to read it. It had better be hidden in your heart when you need it. Hallelujah. That's the power of the word. And I said to him, I told every Bible story I could. All the way from Noah to Abraham. I've never gotten so happy about Abraham offering Isaac. I was happy about everything. And I'm just so excited. And I went from Bible story to Bible story to Bible story. And I'm timing our trip on the road. David got right back online. And I kept this man totally mesmerized. It wasn't me. It's the power of God's word. This is the power of God unto salvation, Romans 16. 116. To the Jew first, also to the Greek. So by the time I got, I went through all the word, I got to 1 John. And I, was, and, I, and I went through Calvary, but I wasn't going to stop at Calvary because I'm not ready for him to get saved till we get to Chuba because people can be saved but not sanctified. And I said, he might get, get a hold of Jesus but still decide he's got something on his mind. So I thought, I'm going to get, I'm gonna get him saved. I'm going to lead him to Jesus right when we're pulling into Juba. So I took him to 1 John. I'm coming to the end of the word, and I said, and we got to walk in love as he's in love. we got to forgive one another. And I said, and, and, and we have fellowship with one another. And I said, that's, that's, that's possible when we forgive. And he looks at me by this time. He has hung on every word I've been saying hour after hour. And every once in a while, he'd ask, what'd they do that for? Why'd they do that? Well, how come? They? You know, people love stories. They love Bible stories. And so when I said that about walk in love, he said, Oh, I think that's what our nation needs, isn't it? I said, Jacob, that's exactly what this nation needs, and that's why I'm here.
And he looked at me startled like he's coming back to reality for a minute. He goes, why are you here? I was going to kill you. I said, I knew you were, but I have a message for you stronger than death. And his name is Jesus. Now, hallelujah. By the time we pulled into Juba and I'm offering him the message of life, whose name is Jesus, both of these men pray after me to receive the Lord Jesus into their hearts. Praise Jesus. Praise Jesus. Never think this word is void of power for a minute. Now, after they pray to receive Jesus, he said, would you come to my village? It's up there by Chad. And he said, it's the killingest village in South Sudan. That's what they say, killingest. It's a killingest. I said, Jacob, yes, I'll go. I wrote down the name of his village. Our missionaries are in his village today. They've planted a church, run a Bible school, and evangelizing that whole area. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So as they were getting out of the car, and we were dropping them off, I said, Jacob... I'm going to give you this. He looked at me. Nobody's given him a thing in his life. He's probably a 19 or 20-year-old guy that's killed more people than you can imagine. They start him at 8. They recruit kids at 8 and 10 years old to be in the military. And he grabbed that Bible from me. He clutched the Word of God like it was a million dollars. Oh, my... Brothers and sisters, if we could value the preciousness and the power of God's word, we would consume it night or day, night and day. We would keep the word playing in our houses. We would keep it scripture memorized. We would write it on cards on our hands, on our forehead, and on the walls, and talk about it coming in and going out like Deuteronomy 6 says. He clutched that Bible. He grabbed it. He said, you're going to give this to me. I said, on one condition. I said, I'm going to give this to you free, but this is the most expensive book in the world. I said, it costs the Son of God his life to sign it so you, your promises could be yours. And I said, so on one condition, that you read it every day, and then every day you have to tell somebody what you read. Oh, I'll do it. I promise. He had tears running. I promise you I'll do it. And then I said to him, do you know what that makes you? I said, Jacob, that makes you a missionary. You got in the car as a murderer, and you met Jesus, and he's changed you into missionary. In a few hours, and both of them took a Bible and made a commitment to be missionaries to their people. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise Jesus. God can do that fast, what we can't do in a lifetime. When we stay in prayer and we walk in the word, and that is our hiding place and our dwelling place. And as Hebrews 8 says, it's the new covenant written upon the tablets of our heart. So I want to talk to you about desperation. Do you know why I go on those roads? Is I'm desperate for those Jacobs to come to Jesus. I don't want to fly over their heads. I want to drive into the enemy's camp and pull them out of the flames. And when we're desperate for Jesus, we will be desperate for what he's desperate for. We'll be desperate for the kids, the souls, the lost that don't yet know him. But we can't be desperate for them until we're desperate for him.